Right, hello, greetings. Um, so, welcome, it's Thomas Daffin speaking. Um, this is my weekly kind of fasting Sunday talk. Um, but today is quite special, it's the midsummer solstice. So we're talking 20th of June today. And I'm going to be in a few hours uh, time kicking off a all night midsummer peace festival on Zoom for my friends and colleagues around the planet discussing, you know, many things in this chaotic world. What is there left to celebrate? Well, you know, many things. We have life, we have hope, we have love, we have truth, we have scholarship, we have thousands of sacred texts. We can come together and share whatever our race, culture, religion, creed, and we can reach a higher level of um, understanding and celebrate that commonality instead of emphasising the differences. So that's what the Stonehenge Peace Festival will be about um, tonight. Um, by the time you're listening to this, you know, it will have happened, but you'll be able to watch it online. And some of you may attend it, so I hope so. Um, right, so this, <coughs> this is my sort of pre-festival thoughts. Um, and I'll be sharing them from, you know, my various perspectives and so on, as usual. Um, as you, some of you may know, um, as a Druid and a long-time campaigner for the rights of pagans and Druids, not just at Stonehenge, but at, at sacred sites throughout Europe, and indeed throughout the world, I think the suppression of paganism is one of the dark um, aspects of the triumph of monotheism. You know, if you look at how Christianity conquered its pagan tribes, be they Latvians or, or um, the Germanic tribes, the Saxons, you know, they used to chop down their sacred trees and things. Um, and the Muslims were doing this in, in, in their part of the world. And the Jews had done it even beforehand with, with their suppression of goddess traditions. Um, you know, it's documented in the Bible, uh, which is a sort of tract for monotheistic rites against pagan, pluralistic goddess rites. Um, and I think one of the most influential books of, of mine, after I'd read the Bible, and, and, you know, it's a very convincing case is made in the Bible for how these pagans are terrible and they need to be suppressed because they all worship goddesses and do human sacrifice and stuff. So, you know, you can really psych yourself into that. And that's where the 17th century reformers who were steeped in the King James Bible were... That's why they were burning witches all over Britain and America and all over Europe at the time. Because if you just read the Bible alone, and, and that's the only context you have, you end up a sort of, you know, a bit of a psycho who thinks that everyone that isn't on your team should be uh, killed off. You know, you can, you can end up a very um, sad and troubled kind of mind. Now, this is where higher education comes in, okay? Because if you... If you read the Bible with, with the reference material, with the scholarship, with the archaeological finds, with the linguistic analysis of the Bible, if you read the, um, all the books that weren't put in the Bible, like the books of Enoch and the Gnostic Gospels and the Mary Magdalene Gospel and the Thomas Gospel, if you read the bigger context, the bigger picture, as I've done, or it's taken years of scholarship to do so, you realise that, hey, this, this narrative that Genesis to the apocalypse of John tells us is actually, you know, a, a one angle. It's a rant. It's, it's a distortion. It's, it's the first spin, actually. Um, and here we are all in lockdown, people saying, well, it's all a spin and we don't know. We're not being told the truth. My friends, we haven't been told the truth for at least, you know, since the invention of writing, actually. <laughs> because the truth, the point about... Mm, the Bible is it was it was created by peoples, tribes, West Semitic tribes, related to the Phoenicians at exactly the time when the alphabet was invented and discovered. And so they tried to put truth into alphabetic form and they excluded visual truth, musical truth, spiritual truth, you know, the, the thought truth of telepathy. All that stuff goes out the window and you just have your alphabetic truth. Now, um, Leonard Schlein, in his book, The Alphabet Versus the Goddess, goes into this. He explains what was going on. And it was a bit of a, bit of a setback for 
people that have what's called lantern consciousness. This is a phrase um, I've been introduced to by a friend in America, um, as opposed to laser consciousness, that look, looks at one thing at a time in detail. No, lantern consciousness looks at the whole bigger picture, you know, and it's like that card in the tarot where the hermit holds a lantern, or Christ holds a lantern in that wonderful painting by the pre-Raphaelite artist. Um, <coughs> So lantern consciousness will get it out, out, gut us out of this muddle that we're in as a planet. And, and that sort of monofocus consciousness has got us into it. Okay. Um, and the most important book, if you, if you want to take this further in terms of biblical studies, is read The Paradise Papers by Merlin Stone, an American sculptress, artist. I think, sadly, she's dead now. One of the pioneers of feminist biblical studies. Amazing scholar. I love her to bits. Um, and she's, she, was, she wrote this book in the, in the late 70s. I read it in the early 80s, and it transformed my way of thinking about Christianity. I, I think it's still possible to salvage tremendous wisdom from the Bible, uh, but you have to dive in deep into the esoteric um, hermeneutics. So in the Jewish text, you have to dive into the Kabbalah, which is what they've done. I mean, that is what authentic Judaism does. And in the Christian text, you have to dive into authentic Gnostic um, hermeneutics and wisdom hermeneutics. Um, so, it, yeah, it can be done. Um, and, and certainly, I believe that, that the great prophets, the sages, Moses, Abraham, Elijah, Ezekiel, Enoch, on down to Jesus and, and beyond, they, that's where they were coming from. Uh, right down to Muhammad, who I'm absolutely sure was coming from that same universalistic wisdom, esoteric source that they all come from. You know. um, right, so that's the first thing I want to say. And, and um, so that's why we're celebrating tonight the Midsummer Peace Festival. The old Druids uh, who built Stonehenge and Avebury and um, all the other sacred sites of, of, of Northwestern Europe, Karnak and so on, they were the wisdom keepers of their era, their generations. <coughs> they were in charge of the ceremonies of life and birth and death. The women initiates were the, the ones that were the midwives that brought the baby into the world. And that then at death were there as you died and guided you into the next world, into your life review and your, you know, reincarnation. Um, the Druids were trained seers who could see between the worlds, see all these phases of human existence and the miracle that it represents. So they, they draw it as a spiral. At Gavrinus, the island off, um, you know, near in, in Brittany, there's a sacred tomb temple with, with amazing carved spirals on the walls. Um, you have the same kind of thing at, um, at uh, Newgrange in, in Ireland, which I've been to, another sacred site. And um, certainly in Stonehenge, the people that built Stonehenge were, were into expressing their metaphysics through art. We don't have the wooden structures that were there at Woodhenge and Durrington Walls. There were great temples where the villagers lived who built the stones over, over centuries, millennia. They would have had their art carved into their wooden pillars and so on. And also on their bodies, body art, um, the tattoo of the, the spirals and so on. As in Maori art, if you look at the Maori um, face painting and body painting, the Celts have something very similar. So, yes, they, they were awesome times. What we call Wessex culture was behind Stonehenge. Um, and it was, it, was, um, it was part of a pan-European culture. So the Wessex culture people were masters at goldsmithing. They made incredibly intricate gold brooches and lozenges with spirals and... and um, like labyrinthine uh, patterns engraved on these gold, very fine gold works, which are now, you can see them in the Salisbury Museum, where they have a lot of the finds from Stonehenge. Exactly the same kind of gold work was happening in, in, in um, Ireland. It's in the National Museum of Dublin. I've been there. Um, and the same quality of craftsmanship, this gold. And it's all about metaphysical patterns, designs. You know, it's spirals, it's labyrinths, it's lozenges. And you find exactly the same work at Mycenae, which is in, obviously, Greece. Uh, it was the, the citadel, the great center of Greek culture at the time of Agamemnon and Troy, and, you know, the whole epics of, of the ancient Greeks. Well, 
they were doing the same, exactly the same art um, on gold. And I've seen it in the museum at Mycenae. And I've seen, hang on, this is the same stuff they're producing. And it's all about the same time as ancient Stonehenge, 1500 BC, 1700 BC. And <coughs> I'm 100% I'm sure, me and Colin Renfrew both, that the people that were designing it in Mycenae were also travelling to Western culture and doing it there and showing their skills and then on to Ireland. You know, this was one culture. And that's why in the ancient Irish legends, um, they often say that different tribes of invaders came via Greece. Yeah, they did, because the Greeks were highly sophisticated um, poets, bards, as were the Celts, and they were like cousins anyway. Um, so that's what we're celebrating today, the, the bardic tradition. Yesterday we had Obod doing a summer solstice festival. We had Dave the Bard and other great singers doing their music. Today is going to be the intellectual, um, you know, the talking heads, if you want. Uh, there might be a few songs, there'll be a few poems. Um, you know, the Druids and Bards, we, we share that whole delight in, in discourse, in, in thought. And as the ancient Greeks inventing philosophy, I mean, inventing philosophy, I mean, they, they, they inherited it from the, the millennia of pre-written philosophy. So when we say the pre-Socratics like Thales, Pythagoras, you know, they, they were inventing philosophy. No, they were just using the new alphabet invention, which got to Greece quite early, got to Greece before it got to Ireland and, and Britain and Europe in the Celtic world. Um, they were then putting their thoughts down. So figures like Parmenides, he writes this great poem to the goddess. How can we find truth? Well, we go on a journey. We travel to the goddess on a kind of chariot type thing. Read Parmenides, one of the great early philosophers that Peter Kingsley has written about um, in his invocation of the, the city-state of southern Italy, which was under these devotees of Apollo, Peter Kingsley, in the Dark Places of Wisdom. It's a masterpiece. Parmenides was, was one of the last of a line of Apollo, um, like part shaman, part philosopher, part king. You know, the Druid elders, if you want, had appointed him. Um, and, and that's what philosophy is. That's where philosophy comes in from. So we'll be, we'll be hearing about this tonight. Um, and it will be epic, I hope. Um, there's a lot of work to be done. Apollo is the god of healing, um, as you know, as well as prophecy. Stonehenge was dedicated to Apollo, said the Greeks, and they're not fools. They meant the Celtic equivalent to Apollo the Lord of Light, who was also the god of healing and music. And what would have happened at Stonehenge during these festivals was music, dance, some rituals, ceremonies, prayers, um, individual probably little healing events going on as different sages and shamans dealt with people's personal problems. You know, and this has been going on for thousands of years and it still goes on. Only, of course, now it's not happening because it's all shut down, we're under lockdown, we're under the pandemic rules. So it was cancelled by the fake prime minister we have, who is, is a charlatan that shouldn't be in power. No, no credibility at all. Um, the, uh, the Indian variant that's sweeping across Britain shouldn't have been allowed in. It was because he permitted Indian tourism to come flooding in, you know, without... I mean, the man has no intelligence at all, either morally or intellectually. Um, he's on the way out, thank God, after the amazing Liberal Democrat win in Amersham, where I used to teach for the University of Oxford. Thank God for the good people of Amersham have told the Tories, you know, they, they need to leave the planet, actually. Um, the ignorance with which they've compounded the problems of um, the pandemic are a state crime, as my friend John Danzig has rightly pointed out. And... Um, you know, and, and the way they implemented Brexit was a state crime as well, um, committed by criminals, actually. We, um, we now know that uh, Nigel Nix and all these people that ran Cambridge Analytica, they literally are criminals, and they should go to prison. Uh, and they will eventually end up there um, <clears throat> in, in, a, in a just resolution to this crisis. Um, Michelle Barney has just written a book about Britain's negotiating style of Brexit, and it was non-existent. It, it was the most ill-thought-out and badly implemented and ignorant policy that anyone has ever implemented in the British state 
Since it was first conceived in 1603 when King James united the crowns of Scotland and England, it is the worst single. And it's the arrogance of the, the people that were behind it that I find is very interesting spiritually. You know, I'm a philosopher, but I'm a philosopher um, who specialised in religious studies and religious philosophy for many years and peace studies. And I find this a wonderful morality tale, you know, History has meaning. It, it's not just random events going on. It's, it tells a story, as Homer pointed out, and that's why the Greeks and the Celts loved each other, because the Druids also, we know history is a series of moral stories done by spirit. And this Brexit story is, is epic, because it shows the ignorance and arrogance and hubris of the remaining English um, imperial elites that think they run the world from Eton and and um, you know no they don't it's shocking you know we're supposed to be living in a multicultural world in in peace and harmony the European Union is a very good step in that direction and um, so anyway um, I want to talk now about Father's Day because <clears throat> it is Father's Day and that's a nice day in the year. And because I'm a father and have a father, and we all do, not all of us, you know, I mean, the men among us, I just want to chat a little bit about fathers um, and why they're important, really, and what, you know, what they mean. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I love my father. I want to start off by telling and sharing a little bit about my father. He was called George Daffern. Nigel was his middle name. And he was from Warwickshire. Um... He was born in London, but he was actually brought up in Warwick, which is a beautiful town, city in Warwickshire, with a fantastic castle. He knew it very well. He went to Warwick School, which was an Anglo-Saxon school. It was going before William the Conqueror ever landed. Um, and Dad was apparently a very good pupil. I have his reports and stuff saying he was a bright lad. Um, and I have his family tree, so I know quite a bit about my father. Um... And what he always used to say is the name Daffern was originally de la Fern, and it was a Norman name. So the de la Ferns came in with, with the Norman conquest. Uh, as, um, and I did discover in a um, doomsday book appendix in the University of Sussex, wandering along once looking for my family history, I found the de la Fern referenced in the Worcestershire uh, kind of region of Britain, which is not too far from Warwickshire. And I'm pretty sure that Dad must have, he would have told this orally by his father and grandfather. Uh, I'm sure that it's true that we were descended from these Normans, <coughs> the de la Fernes. Um, but, you know, the, the full tree has not yet been unravelled. <coughs> but he was a very good man. I remember him as a very kind, highly intelligent he never went to university. He, he was sort of streetwise. He went to what they call night school, and he trained as a personnel management expert. In the 1930s. And then during the war, in the 1940s, he was working at a senior level, helping run the factories as a management expert. And, you know, they were trying to make sure... His job as personnel officer in a big factory with 10,000 workers on shifts was to make sure, A, they were all paid on time, B, their health and safety was taken care of, C, they weren't drinking on the job, um, that they had a proper contract, that they knew their rights um, and their duties, and that there was a proper flow of communication between the workers and the management. He was the sort of middleman that would take your complaints... Um, concerns, issues to the management and try and resolve it and then come back and, you know, try and keep the factory going in everybody's interest. Um, and, and I think he was working for a big company called Metal Box, which was making all kinds of things, including mess tins for the soldiers at the front, down to like pots and pans, people on the home front. Um, it was a very big company at that time. And he met my mother there, because my mother also worked for Metal Box in a different company, different factory up in the north in Manchester. And they fell in love, um, as one does, during the war. I mean, it must have been epic, really. 
I've just been watching this film Reds, which I strongly recommend. I think it's Warren Beatty and Nicole Kidman. It's an epic um, about um, um, the this journalist um, uh, Jack. Um, um, gosh, who wrote um, you know Ten Days That Shook the World. Um, can't remember his surname, sorry it slipped from my memory, but it's an amazing film about watching the revolution. And you see, when my father and mother met, they were both on the left politically. Um, they were appalled at fascism, at Nazism, they were seeing the fruits of Nazism falling on their heads and destroying London. They were, they'd seen how the appeasement of the Nazis and the fascists had led to World War II, it sort of made them hungry for more land. And they were shocked, really, I think. I mean, they were, my father was from a sort of, you know, they're both from kind of middle-class backgrounds. My father was, um, his father had been in the army um, in South Africa, had been in the Royal Household Cavalry, so that's one of the people that guard the monarch in Buckingham Palace with the great big helmets and trot around on horses um, with, with all kinds of plumes and, you know, um, swords, ceremonial swords and things, um, but had also ended up somewhere on the left. And, you know, they wanted an, a better society that worked for everyone, not just for the elites, not for the aristocracy alone. They wanted a society where every, every person, every child was loved and cared for. So they, they welcomed things like the NHS when it was created after World War II. Um, and they were active in the socialist movement in, in London, in Britain, my mother was active in the Communist Party, which was, you know, more left than the Labour Party. And at that time was, was quite active, and there were millions of members. They were campaigning for a better Britain. Um, and they wanted peace, and they wanted, um, you know, um, they didn't want sort of endless war. And they were supporting the Soviet intervention in the war to, de to defeat Hitler. Um, and... So that's where they came from, and they went then to America after the war, and they eloped and, and went off, you know, they, had, they were very much in love, um, and they traveled all around states looking into how management can, um, can, can operate in a way that doesn't destroy the lives of the workers. Sort of, is there a way that management can behave rationally? you know, um, to help the workers. And um, my father became a specialist in this. And he wrote this book, which I'm going to quote from, in 1960, um, <clears throat> which he prefaces, he says, it's a small attempt <coughs> at a big problem. And it's signed by George. And it's really, it's a very interesting book, actually, in 1960, quite prescient. Management Development in a Changing World. Now, uh, at this time, when this book was published, he'd been head of Canadian National Railways Personnel Division for 10 years. And that was during the time when I was born in Montreal. He was working as head of the personnel service for the whole Canadian National Railway system, which is extremely important in Canada. Because in those days, there were not so many planes. People kept in touch by train. It moved the goods from the Pacific to the maritime provinces to Ottawa, to Toronto, to Montreal, across this huge continent of 3,000 miles um, from, from coast to coast. And it kept Canada going, really. Um, and Dad was in charge of how, making sure the workers were you know, properly remunerated, health and safety were dealt with, they had proper working contracts, their, their lives were not being you know, ruined and abused by long working hours. Um, and likewise, they were fulfilling their obligations to the company, to the CNR, and were delivering, you know, the whatever, eight hours a day they were supposed to work. And in all weathers, you know, these trains had to keep going even in the Canadian winter. When, and they were equipped with snow plows that they could get through. I mean, I always think it's a joke when Britain's trains collapse, you know, the first little snowfall or fall of leaves. Canadian trains are built to keep going through that the blizzards, the snowfalls, the rest of it. Um, so he, that was his job. So he'd spent 10 years doing that. 
living in Montreal where I was born. And then he decided to come back to Britain and set up a company specializing in management training. And it, here's their little leaflet, Daffin and Associates, teamwork and industry. And he wanted his ideas to get out into uh, mainstream thought. And the main thing he was campaigning for was this thing called management by objectives. He said, what we can do if, in a company, if there's tension between the workers and the managers and so on, is what we need to do is agree common objectives so that the workers, the management, the bureaucrats, the owners, the shareholders, they all know what the objective is. And you articulate them, you write them down. So in the case of Canadian National Railways, it was you know, to have a fully functioning, safe railway service that spans the entire Canadian uh, subcontinent and keeps going in all weathers and, and fulfills the needs of the population of Canada for movement, including movement of goods and so on. Um, you know, you could imagine the sort of objectives you read out. And then everybody could see their role, be it as a linesman, as a signal worker, as a, um, you know, a company boss or some, a train driver, you know, or the guy that uh, collects the tickets on the train. Everyone has a role to play within the bigger objectives. Now, that was Dad's idea, management by objectives. Now, it was, it was taken up, it was invented simultaneously by him and, and a guy called Peter Drucker, who had better sort of uh, PR contacts, and therefore in the management manuals it's called Peter Drucker's theory, but it was their theory, in fact. Um, and I think it was in the zeitgeist, you know. So... <coughs> Anyway, this is the book which launched his work, and I just want to read from the introduction. 1962, okay. Man has reached the most vital dilemma of his career, as we have known since 1945. He has, by the use of his intelligence, brought himself to the point where he can go forward to a much higher form of life on Earth, or he can remove himself from it. So far, his intelligence has been used to utilise the material things of nature and very little to get to know himself and to put himself to best purpose. Despite the humanitarian laws and justice that man conceived and that have been handed down for thousands of years, man still fights his fellow creatures for the material wealth on earth. And instead of creating social habits, that permit all mankind to share the good things nature has provided, he has created nuclear bombs that can blow him to smithereens. As Albert Einstein said in 1946, the atomic bomb has altered profoundly the nature of the world. There is no defence in science against the weapon that can destroy civilization. That's Einstein's quote. Yet man has the intelligence to change his approach to himself and to his fellow creatures if he so wills. He has also now obtained, along with his bombs, the technical knowledge to provide enough material wealth for all mankind to share peaceably. In such a dilemma, industrial management has a crucial role to play. As the providers of much of the necessary material wealth, they must ensure enough of it for everyone on earth. In addition, they must help to change men's attitudes towards each other. And in this role is management's first problem. Charity must begin at home. But much selfishness, oppression and aggression are generated at a man's workplace. And the mutual trust, respect and cooperation that the peoples of the earth need for survival cannot be forthcoming unless they also come throughout industry. Okay, you can see why, why, why Dan was writing this book at that time. I mean, 1960 was after the H-bomb trials had happened. Uh, my mother and he were active peace campaigners against nuclear weapons from, from the war onwards. Um, and I think they were, they were intellectual optimists who believed that we can use our human intelligence to solve these problems. That was why Dad bothered with his career in management, and 
he worked at quite a high level. Um, it, you know, and and that work continues. I remember, unfortunately, he died when I was seventeen. So, in honour of Father's Day, I want to say thank you to my father, George. You know, who was a great man in his way, totally neglected by the history books. No one's ever heard of him. This book, I think, deserves being refounded because it came from that generation of early management specialists that saw the joined upness between what goes on in a factory or corporation or workplace and the bigger ethical and indeed spiritual issues. And I think Dad was way ahead of his time on that. Um, and nowadays, of course, it's all come back in vogue. I mean, the great management gurus of today all saying the same thing that Dad was saying way back in 1960. You know, we won't solve the problems of the world unless we solve the problems of industry. And, and um, I just listened to a brilliant talk by Paul um, Polman, I think he's called, who was the management chief executive of Unilever for many years, who tried to change the way Unilever acts as a global corporation responsible for, you know, thousands of, not just jobs, but thousands of people's lives and livelihoods, but, and, and how to do it in a way that is not going to damage the environment, not going to destroy nature. Um, you know, Dad was foreseeing all this stuff, really. Okay, so that's it. Homage to Dad. Here's a picture of him, a photograph of him, um, a Jasper, looking very much a man of the 1950s, with, with my elder brother and sister, wearing their little Canadian suits, um, in the you know, a Jasper on, on a train stop. This is him with my mother, um, uh, you know, during their years, uh, early courtship and marriage. George and I, mean, they were, uh, you know, amazing people. I love them very much. They're my parents, for God's sake. <laughs> and here's a picture of me and my mother and father um, when I was a little boy. I guess I'm about ten or nine there. And that was apparently taken on Beachy Head in Sussex. Because we moved to Brighton. In 1961, we, we left Canada and we moved to Brighton. And most of my, you know, then my early years, teen years, school education was going on in Brighton and Sussex. So thank you, Dad. Um, and he died, sadly, tragically, when I was 17. Um, and is buried in, in, in Brighton. His ashes are scattered there. Um, but in my work for peace and my institute that I run, which was inspired by my mother and her work at the University of London to create such an institute with colleagues, and then I was appointed to bring it into fruition, that peace institute that I still run and direct, um, you know, is, is a living homage to, to, to the dreams of that generation, my parents' generation that saw through World War I, uh, World War II, the horrors of it. In fact, my mother was was born in January the first, nineteen fourteen. So she saw, um, she saw World War One as well. Um, and my father, likewise, he was born in nineteen eleven. Um, but you know, I think that generation thought that at the end of World War Two, the world surely would come together and never do this again. They they believed in. The UN, they believed in UNESCO. My mother and father were active members of the UNA supporting association in Brighton for many years. Um, and, you know, they, they, they were internationalists who believed in, in Britain's role within the wider world, our responsibilities in the Commonwealth, but also in Europe. And my mother was a French teacher and would bring the family and, and my father here to France every summer for two weeks of idyllic holidays in the south of France, some of my happiest memories. Um, and we have photographs of all these. And Dad was often, you know, he would happily play the role of a French peasant wearing a beret. Here's a picture of him in the back garden in Brighton.